fact is we just need preachers to be clear and let their voices boom and let it offend whoever it must offend because it pleases God and gives glory to his name. Riverside Church located at 3045 Richardson Bridge Road in Princeton, North Carolina. Join us as we unleash the Bible one verse at a time. of at the river i'm pastor kevin and you're watching the outreach ministry of riverside church called at the river we would love you to come join us one of our our service times on sunday morning starting at 10 a.m and also evening service starting at six o'clock and don't forget midweek service at seven o'clock right there on wednesday nights if you would go ahead and grab your bible turn to the book of john if you have been paying attention and following along with us we have been going verse by verse chapter by chapter in the book of John and now we're in John chapter number two we're midway looking at verses number 12 on to verse number 22 so we'll be exegeting or uh, we will be explaining breaking down these portions of text now the reason we do it that way you might ask why do y'all go through the Bible verse by verse that sounds so boring of course it sounds boring to the goats but to the sheep oh they love it it's good sheep food to the sheep because the good shepherd tends the sheep the the goats want to be entertained. The goats want smoke machines and lasers. They want a disco ball to fall. They want a they want a pole dancer. They want they want a, 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 a motorcycles and a, a, a cannon. And they want clowns. But for the Christian and the the sheep, the good shepherd tells us to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And mainly, let's just use plain logic. Imagine reading a novel in a book. You wouldn't jump around in that novel and book. You will use it systematically. You'll begin in chapter number one, and you'll go to chapter number two. Uh, maybe you might read the end of the book to decide, hey, if I want to read this or not. You can do that as well. If you read the book of Revelation, you can see the story of redemption and how Jesus comes to die for sinners and know that no matter how bad it gets throughout the Scripture, Jesus wins in the end. But in the middle of this redemptive story, we hear about our hero, Jesus Christ, referring to chapter number two of John. Go ahead and open your Bible and look at verse number 12. Previously in this chapter, we see where Jesus leaves the party known over at Canaan land, known as the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. Isn't it fitting that Jesus, the bridegroom of the church, shows up at a place where there are vows exchanged, where the husband or the husband or the groom will look over to his bride and tell her that he commits himself to her that he will actually extend his arm and cover her no matter what rainy day comes he's going to shield her and he's going to be there for her how fitting for the church to read in the book of john the youngest of the disciples to pin this and read in chapter number two that jesus turns the water into wine and performs the first miracle there because we as the church can see that the old testament the old ceremonies those jars that they used were symbolic of the Old Testament. Those old jars, those old ceremony washings that they used every day was now to be filled with water and now transformed into wine. We understand that this ain't Welch's juices. This ain't a juicy juice. This is actually wine. It's not imitation. And we know that from the text because the text can defend itself. Here we see that the, the master of the feast actually tells the groom, I can't believe that you waited for us to get good and drunk before you brought out the good wine. Here, the wine that he's tasting that Jesus transformed is fermented. It's what we allude to back in the book of Psalms as joy, that God will supply all our joy. And joy is alluded to the wine. At this festivity, there's joy and the wine is flowing. Are you saying, preacher, that I should drink wine? I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that in chapter number 2 that it's it's not about wine. It's not about if you can enjoy a glass of wine and still be a Christian. It's about Jesus. That's what it's about. That he's the fountainhead. That he's the source. It's all about him. If you're lacking joy in your life and if you look into the barrel of your life and it's hollow and you find there is nothing there, well, come to Jesus. 
Come to Jesus and be a, a, someone who's happily married because you have joy unspeakable even when there's times when things are rocky. Come to Jesus if you're a student in school and you're trying to go and honor your mother and father but there's just no joy. I know we all chase happiness but happiness is fleeting and Christian you'll do well to seek joy. Joy unspeakable and you can only find that in Jesus Christ. That's what chapter number 2 the beginning is all about but now we switch gears as Jesus leaves the party he's leaving he's leaving Canaan land him and his disciples and there's only five of his disciples with him at this point but as mama and him that means his mother and his the, his brothers are with him as they're leaving the party now Jesus was invited to the party because everybody wants to invite Jesus to the party I know that some people think that Jesus is a stick in the mud and he's very stoic he doesn't laugh <laughs> he's very boring but that's not the fact the, the fact of the matter that he's the author of life. Of course, there's going to be life in the way he lived. He lived life to the fullest. Nobody ever lived like Jesus because he lived holy. Now, we think that life, living it to the fullest, is going down to the coast and surfing all day, growing long hair and saying, yeah, man, as you play hacky sack and you live your life to the fullest with no responsibilities. But no, Christian, living life to the fullest is being holy and being like Jesus. So we can see that Jesus in his holiness and his righteousness was invited to the parties. He didn't sin with them. He actually preaches to them and sets the standards. That's letting us Christians know that even if we are invited to the party, we're not to sin. Jesus sat down with sinners. He received sinners, but he didn't sin with them. Uh, as we look in chapter number 2, we see in verse number 12, and after this, that means everything we just talked about, he went down to Capernaum. And with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The author John is keeping good details here for us to, to pay attention and read the narrative of Jesus Christ. But now, as we see, time is now catching up, and now there's about to be a big festival to take place right there in Jesus' region. And if you're a good Jew... You're required by the law, by Deuteronomy and the book of Exodus, all those laws that Moses wrote, that you're required to come before the high priest at least three times a year. You're supposed to make the trek. You're supposed to get on your camel, kick the kickstand down, and ride into Jerusalem at least three times a year. And when you come, you're supposed to bring your family with you. You're supposed to bring a sacrifice to the high priest at least three times a year. I know some Christians take that literal. They show up at church on Easter and Christmas and maybe Thanksgiving if they eaten. But you're not under the law. You actually have liberty and you can come freely to church. But we'll get there. I'm going to pump the brakes. I don't want to give away the point of the sermon here. But Jesus is actually going to go over the Passover now. And we learn about the Passover in the book of Exodus when God passed over the children of Israel. Whenever there was a land that was slain in that household and the blood was smeared over the doorpost the death angel stepped over them and they sought out the Egyptians and anybody who did not live, to, live up to the instructions of Moses and took the firstborn and they honored God on that day remembering how God used his outstretched arm and brought Israel out of Egypt that's what the Passover is all about and now there's expectancy in the air. There's electricity. People are excited. Mostly for us to understand in our Western civilization to understand what it's like. It's like around Christmas. There's decorations hung everywhere. People are singing. There's an expectation for that day when everybody gathers around the Christmas tree and they hand out presents. People are excited. It's like Macy's Thanksgiving parade. People are excited to gather around to see a Garfield come by or Pikachu or whoever your favorite float is. There's an excitement in the holiday of the Passover and the people are gathering on the street. There's congestion everywhere. There's vendors all over on the side of the highway selling uh, possum pops or whatever. They're selling all kinds of trinkets. They're selling all kinds, of, all kinds of things that are used for the travelers that are going through the area. And now Jesus will make his way towards Jerusalem for this Passover and his family's coming with him. And we see in verse 13, and the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Why did Jesus go up to Jerusalem? I mean, he's God. If anybody's exempt for keeping God's laws, it's got to be God. See, Jesus ain't a crooked politician. He doesn't get immunity. He, he actually brings himself down under the law to keep the law, to 
help people like me who could never keep the law. He comes and brings himself under the submission of his own commandments to show somebody like me, a living rebel, somebody like me who does not want to keep God's law, and he keeps God's law perfectly, and then it is a credit to my account. Already we see here the story of grace and mercy in verse number 13, that Jesus keeps the law of God fully. And now you might have the attitude, well, Jesus kept the law, I don't have to, and I'm not going to. Well, you're not being like Jesus. That's not legalism. Because Jesus actually tells his disciples, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Woo, I know you need some ice for that burn. Uh, you might need some, uh, 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 some kind of ointment for that burn. But here, Jesus goes up to the temple. He's not required to. He does it happily. He does it more willing. I wonder, you Christian, do you go willingly to church on Sundays or are you drugged there by your spouse? Do you go there out of guilt? Do you go there out of anger? Do you go there with other motives to see who came and who didn't? Do you come to see who came and who didn't and gossip about who was there and who wasn't? Do you go to church to see who drove what? Do you go to church because you have to go because you're singing in the choir? Do you go to church just to see what the pastor is going to preach about? Do you go to church because you have a political agenda? Do you go to church to do business with everybody else and rub elbows with other businessmen in the community? Do you go to church because it's, it's a safe environment? You can go there and they can tell you how special you are and how important you are, that you are a snowflake in the eyes of God. And if God had your picture on uh, in heaven, it would be on the refrigerator and he would come every time and smile and he would just love you even though you're the biggest sinner that the world has ever seen. Well, what is your motive to going to church? Not that you have to, that you get to. You get to gather with the other faithful and hear about Jesus and what he's done for sinners. If you're going to a church and you're comfortable in your sins, sitting there in your pew, that's not a good church. If the pastor does not step on your toes, if he don't stomp the life out of you sometimes because you live in a sinful life, you're going to the wrong church. If that pastor, the preacher, if the deacons and the congregation are more concerned about your tithing and your attendance than your salvation and your holiness, you're going to the wrong church. And take my suggestion, run from that church. Run from a church where they can't correct you. The only sin in some churches is correction. That I can sin all I want, but don't tell me that I'm wrong. Don't tell me that I'm sinning. I don't know how we got on this, but somebody needs to hear it. We see that Jesus attends the Passover meeting. He gathers with his family. Uh, are you habitual in your attending the synagogue like Jesus? Jesus was found teaching. He was found teaching in the places of the assembly. Are you a Christian? And do you routinely find your, yourself in a place, not because you're the teacher, but because you're being taught? Oh, man, preacher, I can hear the clicks all over the world. People are just cutting off this episode. I don't want to hear what he's got to say anymore. I don't like the way he's saying it. In verse number 14, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. Now what's the problem with this? I mean, Caiaphas and Ananias, who are the high priests, they were co at the time. One of them was actually replaced because he was so corrupt and the Romans put the other one in. Ananias and Caiaphas here had set up a deal and made it so, so easy to go to church, go to the temple. Imagine if you were a Jew... And you're required by the law of God to go to the temple at least once or twice or three times a year. Imagine if you had to trek a hundred miles or maybe more. Maybe you're from Dan or Bathsheba. That's the northern regions of Israel. And you had to go all the way to Jerusalem. You had to bring a sacrifice. You got to bring an oxen. You got to bring some pigeons. You got to bring, uh, bring some sheep. You got to bring all kinds of sacrifices on the trek. And when you get there... They have inspectors. These are those who are the Levi tribe. These are the high priest's assistants. They would look over these animals. And if there was some, some kind of flaw, if they were missing a hair here, there was a growth there, maybe the animal looked tired. Uh, maybe they, they didn't like the way the animal leaned on its side because it was tending to one, one, one side of the leg and maybe it walked with a limp. They would disqualify that animal and say, hey, you got to buy one of these animals. These animals right here have low miles. These animals right here, these animals are fresh. They're clean and they're desirable. So we're going to exchange them. Then we will do it for a small fee. Just a finder's fee, pay up, no problem, we'll do that. 
So maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not going to carry my animal all the way through the, through the temple. They got animals there. So when I get there, I get a couple of pigeons, maybe a dove. Hey, maybe spring for a sheep. And that way they'll slaughter that animal on the altar for me to cover my sins for at least another year. But don't forget about the money changers. Now maybe you're in a region outside of Israel and you're going to the temple because not necessarily everybody within the region of Israel is a Jew. Not everybody outside the reason, regions of Israel are not Jewish or Jewish. Maybe you're a Jewish person, you lived up in Gilgal, or you lived over uh, in the Turkey regions, or you're in Africa, and you make your way to the temple, you would be carrying a different currency than the Roman currency. So what their job is to do, when you got there, for just a day's wage, just a day's wage, a couple of hundred dollars, 100% 100 interest, we will exchange your currency so you can tithe that you can make sure you give what the, the kind of currency that we accept here. You know what I mean? You can't bring Bitcoin up in here. We ain't going to take any of the, the, the Canadian dollar. Don't bring any pesos in here, but we'll exchange it for just a small fee. Can you see how this is turning into big business for the high priest? They're making big business deals. And now we see Jesus stepping into the temple. It almost looks like a flea market. You got people haggling over animals. You got priests looking over animals, checking hooves, making them stick out the tongue, checking their teeth, making, good, making sure they're good quality animals for the sacrifice. In fact, these assistants to the high priest would spend about 18 months on farms to be trained to look at animals and know what good quality animals. I mean, they actually trained them to do this. And they would be haggling. Or you're going to charge me $200 for this sheep when I brought my own sheep? Hey, we'll take that old junker off your hands and we'll trade it in for this nice, fresh, young sheep because that's not going to, that's not going to pass quality control. And I bet when they took the old junker sheep in the back, they simply combed them up a little bit, fluffed them up, gave them a little bit of extra feed, and then put them back on the showroom floor to sell again. Can you see how corrupt it's getting? And Jesus steps into the temple. And he sees all these business deals. He sees the money changers actually using usury. And actually, all of this is outside the statutes and the commands of God. But men take liberty with it. They use the place of worship to make a profit. To turn over and sell. And all for the name of God. But in the meantime, I can line my pockets a little better. And I mean, God's going to get his cut, but I got to get mine. Sometimes we do things that God doesn't command us to do, but in the long run we think, well, the, the, the means justifies the ends. We're going to do that just so he'll give him glory. <laughs> Jesus ain't down with that. In fact, in this instance in the rest of chapter number two, you might say that Jesus don't act very Christian. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, you can't be aggressive. Jesus, what you doing? Look at how you're speaking and what you're doing in here. You're disrupting our worship service. Jesus, you're messing up our economical flow here. You're messing with the economy here, Jesus. You can't be messing with my money. What are you doing in here, Jesus? Look at what he does, the Son of God. Here's what he does in verse 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple. And with the sheep and the oxen, he poured out the coins on the money changers and overturned the tables. He was flipping tables and beating people with a whip. That don't sound very Christian. But there's a reason he does all this. Jesus is now causing them to shut it down because people are worshiping their own means. They have their own agendas. They're worshiping themselves. They're worshiping filthy manna. Or it's, that's an old phrase for those who are not caught up with the King James who didn't grow up old school like me. They're worshiping the mighty dollar. They're worshiping money. They're worshiping something other than God. They're making false idols. They're worshiping anything other than the Lord of the temple. Jesus is flipping tables, and he's running people out of town. There's a lot of people who are watching. You're sitting at a lot of tables that Jesus has flipped over. Don't find yourself there. If he will find no glory in that, he will find no honor in that. Quit sitting at tables that Jesus has flipped over. I know some of us think that Jesus is timid, 
and he's very calm and he speaks very softly. He don't want to hurt anybody. He uses the correct pronouns. He don't want to offend anybody. He will use you. He won't say him or her. He will say they or them. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want this to be a safe place. We're going to rain. We're going to have rainbow flags that will take all the crucifixes down. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to marginalize anybody. We don't want anybody to feel like they're left out here. We're all inclusive. In fact, you can belong before you believe here. Oh, boo-hoo. Let's, let's don't sing this power in the blood. Let's sing something else. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Campfire songs. And let's tell little stories and hand out trinkets. Let's do that. We don't want to hurt anybody. But when Jesus shows up at the temple, he's flipping tables and hitting people with whips because they need correcting. The worst thing you can do sometimes, especially in church, is correct people. Woo-hoo! Woo! Call something a sin. Whoa! That's the 11th commandment. That you know the 11th commandment. You got the 10, the big 10. But then there's an 11th commandment. You got to be nice when you say it. You, I mean, you got to say it a certain way or you're going to hurt my feelings because my feelings reign over me. My feelings is that golden calf that I worship and I don't want to step on your feelings because that's your God and I don't want to offend anybody. Jesus didn't care about who he was offending here. He was swinging a whip, flipping tables. Give us more pastors and more preachers who will flip tables and correct people and with stinging across the back if that's what they need. Because Jesus didn't walk in here and say, it's okay, you're okay, we're all okay. Jesus was flipping tables. Jesus was breaking out the whip. If you're in a relationship outside of marriage, it's a sin. If you're bi, tri, if you're non-binary, it's a sin. You're just confused. If you're Stealing and embezzlement, embezzlement from your office, your church, and your ministry, your friends, or your company is theft before holy God. If you're green-eyed and you're lusting and you're looking at other people and wanting what they have, it's called covetous. Repent of your sins. If you're angry and you have not given forgiveness when God has called you to forgive, it's the same as murder in the eyes of God. If you blaspheme his holy name and sit under Hollywood and pay Hollywood to do it and laugh when they blaspheme his holy and righteous name, you're a blasphemer in the eyes of God. If you deny the assembly to gather on the Sabbath day, because that's your day, that's the day you get to rest, you get to deflate that day. Oh, I got to kick back in my lazy boy and everybody's got to serve me. I'm not going to go to a temple and serve God and I'm certainly not going to hear a man correct me when I think everything I think is correct. You're a Sabbath breaker and you've not served God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. The fact is we just need preachers to be clear and let their voices boom and let it offend whoever it must offend because it pleases God and gives glory to His name. Let there be a line drawn in the sand that we're tired of compromising and setting up tables and taking whips away from the pastor who should be correcting people. You might say, well, what's wrong with him? Maybe God's hands on me. And maybe I'm saying something that you need to hear. Find you a church where they're not afraid to correct you. Get an attitude of gratitude saying, Lord, I'm thankful for this assembly because I got a lot of blind spots. There's blind spots in your car. And you got to turn your head to find to make sure there's nobody in your blind spot. There's blind spots in your life. And you got to have people that care about you. Care about you enough to say, "Uh, uh, uh, uh-uh-uh-uh, man, we don't do that. We don't cheat on our spouse. We don't live a frivolous life. Well, there are no repercussions before God because it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. You're going to stand before God and give an account for your life. You can't just live however you want, calling the fouls and the strikes in your life. You are not the highest authority in your life. I know you're watching. You're saying, that's right, preacher, but I'm not your pastor. I don't know you. You might know something about me, but I don't know you. When you die, you probably can contact me and say, hey, uh, have your family do your, my, I could do your funeral, but I don't know you. You need to have a pastor that knows you. You need to be around people who know you and see your blind spots. I, I know you might watch other preaching and teaching on television, but you can't get Jimmy Swagger to come to your house. T.D. Jakes ain't going to show up when the, when the marriage hits the rocks. 
You need a faithful pastor. You need faithful deacons and elders to be a part of your life. People that you have questions you can go to and they won't brush you off and they won't give you a vague answer, but they'll study. Even if they don't know the answer, they'll study together with you in the scriptures and find the truth. He pulled out the coins and the money changers and overturned tables. Jesus, you need to go to anger management. Why, why are you so mad? Why are you so angry? There's a reason. And he says, he says, take these things away in verse number 16. Do not make my house a house of trade. It's not about for your benefit. It's not about you. Usually a place of trade is where we have commerce and we're trying to make a profit. I want to go ahead and just bust all the bubbles in the house, everybody watching, and the millions around the world, letting you know that there's nothing in church for you. It's not about you. It's not about you. In fact, we don't even sing to you. We're not supposed to cater to you. Now, I know there are some churches that cater to people. Well, you remember back in the 80s, we wore these members only jackets, and they had a little strap across the neck. We would wear that. I'm just showing you how old I am. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it later. But the members only, is they're, they're not the ones like a, 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 some, some, some kind of country club that get benefits for being members of a church. The church is not for you. There was an old preacher at the back door. And after the church was dismissing, somebody came up to him and said, I don't like that song. I don't like that song that the choir sang. And the old preacher said, well, that's fine and that's all right because we won't sing it to you. Maybe you don't like the music. You don't like the way the preacher carries himself. It's not for you. It's for the glory of God. It's to make much of it. Maybe you don't like me. I'm not supposed to be influencing and gathering friends. I'm supposed to be making disciples. And sometimes the medicine burns before it starts to heal. Like good old Listerine. When you drink the Listerine, it burns. And you gargle it. It's going to burn. That's how you know it's working. If you're feeling convicted and you feel like your feelings is hurt, go ahead and email the person at the end of this web address and let them know that you're mad about it. And you didn't like how it was said, but hey, you're right. And I repent. I've been staying home, and I'm not doing what God has called me to do. I've not been using my time, my talents, and my treasures honoring God. I've been living my best life now without any repercussions. And thanks be to God that somebody come on my screen and told me that I will stand before you. And I don't call the shots. I'm not the highest authority. It's got to be Jesus. This church ain't about me. It's about God. It's about honoring him. So Jesus, flip all the tables you want. Whip me if you must that I'll line up and honor you. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ. He's the only way to get to heaven.